watching our conference. This is fantastic already. Um, my talk would build up a little bit and be complementary and focus on somehow a slightly different perspective from that uh, given by Harris. This is what I'm going to talk about today, starting from the crisis, from the magic of growth as a magic wand and its crisis, moving on into the perspective of degrowth and its potential for a societal transformation and focusing especially on the potential of degrowth to become and to be a concrete utopia for transforming the social imaginary of our societies. I'm giving a few examples and then wrapping up about desire and autonomy. Um, sorry. Um, economic growth has played for a long time a crucial role in stabilizing modern industrialized societies. It has secured prosperity for today living and for future generations. It has guaranteed employment and social mobility, but also tax revenue, and thus has supported the welfare state. So far, growth has worked like a magic wand for social pacification and for political stability. If the cake grows bigger, as we know, there is no need to redistribute wealth by taking away from the rich, but just distributing the surplus. Growth has thus guaranteed the output legitimation of democratic welfare states. Such a form of dynamic stabilization, which is done by means of growth, in place a steady, pro steady process of expansion and of acceleration. As long as this process can carry on, stability is continuously yet dynamically restored. As my friend Kate Farrell used, used say, usually says, the growth machine is very much like a bicycle that needs moving on or it would fall down. How actually, when we think about growth, this is a quite crazy bicycle. It does not only move on, but it keeps accelerating in order not to fall down. <laughs> Under these conditions, slowing down or stopping leads to a disaster. We need another bicycle or another way to move on. We are currently faced with a fundamental crisis of this dynamization logic. It turns out to have dysfunctional effects for the socioeconomic, political, and cultural reproduction of modern capitalistic societies. Such an imminent dynamic of stabilization has reached a point at which it undermines its own conditions of reproductivity. The growth, rates are still um, the growth rates that are still feasible no longer secure employment, social mobility and welfare. The promise is over. Moreover, as you all know, who, being here today, we are faced with external limits to growth. This includes ecological limits on the side of resources, but also on the side, on the side of the sinks. But also so-called social limits, I think Alberto Acosta mentioned that yesterday as well. Due to the satiation of needs, we have to keep creating new artificial needs in order for the economy to keep growing. And also psychological limits to, due to this continuous acceleration and intensification of the pace of life. I wouldn't say that these limits are absolute limits in general to growth. But these limits reduce the profitability of capitalist investments and therefore spell the end of easy growth, of easy economic growth. Under the crisis, growth has turned from a means for securing well-being into a goal of its own. Holding on to growth at any cost implies even more expansion in order to push the limits further and extending the capacity to exploit, as Francois Schneider usually says. This means 
creation of private debt to cover new needs and create even more new needs, increasing even more investments in big infrastructures, the continuous occupation of new territories in literal sense and in metaphorical sense, and new markets like the markets of ecosystem services, and the increasing willingness to take risks, think of fracking for example. The intensification also means a steady acceleration of social, cultural, and technological innovation, as Harmut Rosa calls it, an overall acceleration of the pace of life, by means of increasing positional competition and the drive to profit accumulation. Okay. Sorry. I thought it, I was slow. <laughs> this leads to a dramatic exacerbation of environmental and social conflicts worldwide and to the impairment of the quality of life. Growth is a goal of its own, does not only increase the pressure on the environment, but also jeopardizes democratic stability and social cohesion. Now, does this mean that the end of growth, of, or easy growth, as I say, said before, will come upon us sooner or later as an unavoidable destiny? As many activists also within the degrowth movement say, the growth path is doomed to end. Economic shrinking will come upon us and under current conditions, as we have heard, it will aggravate the crisis, leading to increasing impoverishment, recession, inequality, and more social conflicts. Do you remember the bicycle? It will fall down. Would that imply, what would that imply? Degrowth under business as usual conditions. It would mean that we will have to adapt and try to make the best out of it. Especially conservative post-growth analysts, especially in Germany, like the German sociologist Meinan Miegel, point out that economic shrinking would mean less tax revenues, obviously, and thus, thus also the shrinking of the welfare state and all its services, and more poverty. Because of, of that, services, especially care-related services, will have to be reallocated to the families and the private sector. Think of care and education. Under these conditions, this is what Miguel says, in order to secure happiness, nevertheless, we will need a cultural and awareness shift to non-materialistic value, such as more family relation, spiritual and community values. According to him, also, philanthropic donations would help reducing misery instead of redistribution measures. Such a vision, I think, of a post-growth society sounds like a step back to pre-modern societies with very high inequality and relatively fixed social roles. You are in a certain place in a society, don't move on from there. Think, for example, of the classic divis division of work between the genders, but also of oppressive patriarchal oppression. Without income ready and wealth redistribution and without public services, the option of enjoying cultural and spiritual values is open only to those who do not have to work all day and having two or three jobs for making a living, and on top of it, take care of family members in their spare time. Such views serve the business as usual logic. Pacification through voluntary simplicity instead of struggles for the redistribution of wealth and the access to participation. Well, most people present at this conference follow a different path and see in the crisis rather a great chance 
to start changing things in a more radical way. For them, degrowth is not simply coping with shrinking, but it requires a radical transformation of the basis institutions of our societies in order to render them independent from the growth addiction. If we want to stick with a bicycle example of metaphor, it's time to start working and changing that damn bicycle. When degrowth activists say, your recession is not our degrowth, this is what they mean. Since a growth-based society, which is no longer growing, is doomed to collapse, we are in need of a new vision for a radical transformation of the basic structure of society towards a degrowth path. The challenge now is how to build a just, solidary and democratic society that is no longer dependent on economic growth for its stabilization and legitimation. Now, you have different models on here, like the idea developed by Peter Victor, the Canadian scholar, and he has named his model degrowth uh, by design, right? Yet, I think design is very, designing a different economic is very important, yet designing politically a different model with few corrections to the existing one will not be enough. The social transformation needed cannot be the implementation of a particular and specific blueprint. And if, it, if so, I think it will be quite dangerous. But it has to slowly, I would say, other would say fast, emerge from the different forces in our society. Degrowth has a very strong potential as a new narrative for catalyzing different drivers actions, initiatives for social transformation. While degrowth in a literal sense, which comes from ecological economics, means the material reduction of the overall scale of the economy, the colored and heterogeneous group gathering under the idea of degrowth, also here in Leipzig, intended in a wider way. As it is, as uh, French degrowth activists say, a mot au but, a projectile word, a bomb word, that hits like a wedge the very core of modern industrial societies. Growth has been indeed, for decades, the undisputable consensus between the Western and the Soviet bloc. Degrowth hits their contradictions and mode of justification and legitimation, it questions the structure of the economy and the cultural infrastructure that justifies it. Therefore, degrowth can play a crucial role in bridging among different groups, approaches, forms of resistance and fights. It can bridge between more antagonistic and more constructive forms of resistance. Take, and as an example, it has been mentioned yesterday, Take as an example for an antagonistic movement all the struggles against unnecessarily imposed mega projects in different European countries, in Germany, for example, Stuttgart 21. Or for, as an example for a constructive model of building alternatives, think of all the initiatives related to the transition towns, social cooperatives, community supported agriculture, and the like. Finally, degrowth can offer a platform for dialogue and alliance among different groups fighting the capitalistic mode of production and its logic of exploitation and expansion, such as post-development movements, peasants' movements all over the world, but also feminists reclaiming the core role of care against the capitalistic logic, but also artists struggling against the productivistic ideology. We have a lot of artistic intervention at this conference. This is wonderful. Degrowth as a project for societal transformation has the power of becoming a concrete utopia. As the great thinker of utopias, Ernst Bloch, has written, abstract utopia 
is a mere, merely wishful thinking, right? Concrete utopias envision what he calls the real possible, what is already slumbering in the meanders, in the coils, in the folds of our present world. Concrete utopias anticipate what Bloch calls the real possible, which is possible not only in general, but on the ground of already existing potentials and tendencies that can unfold and be actualized in the future. Reality is not a flat highway with the, all of signs of Tina, there is no alternatives on it. Reality is a complex fabric made of several threads that compose a visible pattern. We are used to see the main pattern and neglect the threads that constitute it. We are used, um, some of, of these threads are less visible and hidden under the surface. And yet, they are part of the actual world and just wait for being discovered, lifted up, and woven into new patterns. Concrete utopias require a sense for historical tendencies which are already existing in the present and can be unfold in the future. However, this does not happen automatically. This is what Bloch calls a militant optimism, not just a naive optimism. Naive optimism thank you, is blind with regard to relations of power. Militant optimism means identifying the potentials and tendencies for transformation that are already there and that are hidden, and actively fighting, sizing them, and rendering them visible and stronger, taking them and weaving them actively into new patterns. In other words, concrete utopias challenge the social imaginary of dominant ideologies. No ideology, however dominant, or form of domination, can maintain itself in power without some kind of widespread legitimation. Manipulation, false consciousness alone, would not be enough in the long run. This is why dominant ideologies, including the logic of growth, that justifies and legitimizes current institutions and practices in our societies, always bear a surplus, an overflow of meaning that goes beyond the way in which its basic values are actually realized, interpreted, and justified. Each ideology has somehow to promise a better life to all beyond alienation. This surplus of meaning, this overflow of meaning, is the point of leverage for a concrete utopia and entails the seeds for critique and subversion. It rests on already established values that are already widely shared and uses them as the leverage point for enhancing the desire for transformation. Degrowth can represent a shared narrative that can appeal to different forms of discontent and resistance, helping building networks and fruitful alliances. Concrete utopias have both a prefigurative and a performative power. They envision alternative imaginaries by opening spaces for alternatives that are already hidden in the contradiction of the present today. But not only this, more than just envisioning real possible futures, they also embody them in the numerous laboratories in which new spaces are created and protected for actual experimentations and for new experiences. Concrete utopias have the power to transform the social imaginary, as I said. When we speak of social transformation, we have to keep in mind that we have different dimensions of social transformation. I am just focusing here on the social imaginary. I think Harris has focused much more on the first point, which is the structural and the institutional level of social transformation. But we cannot do everything, right? <laughs> right. 
So the social imaginary is not just a cultural dimension of our societies. It, it is the set of deep beliefs, established values, the collective self-understanding of a society that keeps that very society together. Because of our common and shared social imaginary, our practices and actions make sense to us and to others. Like if you go and put a cross on a sheet of paper and put it into a box, and you have the shared social imaginary that you live in a democracy, this action makes sense. If you do it in a different place, in a different setting, it doesn't have the same sense, right? The social imaginary justifies what we do in society in the face of others, conveys social recognition and sometimes also disapprobation. When Serge Latouche says that the first step towards degrowth is the decolonization of the imaginary, he implicit, implicitly thinks of this complex set of meanings that legitimizes society. Now, how can the social imaginary be transformed and changed? Crises offer a great opportunity for transformation, as we have seen. When what we do does no longer correspond to the legitimate expectations we had so far, we start questioning the legitimation background. Collective meaning does no longer work, institutions and practices as well, as otherwise accepted values lose their credibility for us. The promise of growth for increasing well-being does no longer work for many people, at least for those for whom it had worked before, which is mainly members of the middle class, but not only. The perspective of climbing the social ladder turned into a dead end within the crisis. The mythology of merit, you work hard and you get to something, has also vaporized into an increasing intensification of pressure and performances. Growth, growth also does no longer guarantee employment, or at least no employment that allow, allows a dignified living. For, for transforming the social imaginary, we do not need brand new values. As I said before, established values carry in themselves an overflow of meaning that can be explored and developed into new perspectives. Think, for example, of values like freedom or autonomy in the Western countries. They are taken to mean individual freedom and arbitrariness in shaping one's own personal lifestyle in full independence from the surrounding people or the environment, just like the fish of the picture, independent from the water. And yet, the very idea of autonomy bears in itself the potential for the understanding of collective autonomy as a political concept, in which being rooted and embedded in relations and responsibilities is not a limit, but its very condition. The omnipresent value of autonomy can be re-signified to mean, for example, reclaiming, claiming back the capacity to decide about the conditions of our common living and not only about our lifestyles. Social imaginaries also change through social struggles for emancipation, think of the feminist movement, or against discrimination, think of, of the uh, LGBT, the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transsexual movement. Social, societal experiments can be the leverage for transforming the shared imaginary. They anticipate future possibilities and already contribute to create the space in which this possibility can be experienced, lived, and tested. Um, I wanted to show a few examples. We are all familiar with these, these examples, but just to have a sense of what I mean when I say that prefigurative social experiments can contribute to change the social imaginary. Think of the shape of our cities. We live in times in which, due to the dogma of efficiency, 
space is organized in terms of a strict separation between urban and rural areas, between work and life, between production and consumption. Efficient in this is, is this model only under the premise of mass production and mass consumption. Otherwise, it is the most inefficient model you could think of, in which the exploitation of one part is the condition for the survival of the other one. Cities can become spaces, instead, in which food is produced, energy generated, and even resources are obtained if you think of all the materials that are in your smartphones, computers, and other home devices. This requires a new form and spaces for interaction that enable sharing, reducing the amount of surface used for living and sustaining life, decentralizing food and energy production and services, while at the same time guaranteeing cooperation and networks for solidarity. We do witness many experiments on the side of reducing consumption by sharing. However, the more radical shift we need in order to change our imaginary about cities is a step from collaborative consumption to collaborator, collaborative production, as it is fostered, for example, by self-managed cooperatives. The transformation of towns and cities does not only concern people in the global north and is not only a project for middle-class lojas. Just the opposite. We can learn quite a deal from the coping strategies of the poor everywhere in the world in terms of their struggles for self-determination. Take the example of some favelas and their self-managed structure. Planners coming from the outside and importing new models for development, what they call development, might have great new ideas, but will reach nothing if they do not understand that the change has to be implemented, conceived, and supported by those who are primarily involved and know their situation much better. The idea behind the transition style movement here is a radical rethinking of cities, their function, and their meaning. I think that what is really important in the transition style movement is their attention to plurality, local expertise and potentials, participation and networking. And it opens a new space for real experiences. Um, second example, you have heard a lot yesterday from Zilke about the commons and commoning movement. It's a, it, this is about a new and radical thinking of production and sharing that implies the use of what Illich called convivial technologies. If you think of projects like the open source ecology, which is based on the cooperation of people in creating small machines that can be used, for example, in agriculture, by local communities, and thus render a simple life more comfortable. As Silke has said yesterday, the commons movement is not about a, self, a shared and self-organized management of common goods and resources. It embodies a different mode of living relations that are not reduced to merely instrumental relations. Technology becomes convivial if it is rescued from the illusory idea that it is just a neutral means to our goals. Commoning means to reclaim the meaning of, another meaning of technology as convivial technology for the common good. And I could give other examples about solidarity economy and a bunch of other things, but I'm moving on to my last part. There is a critique against lots of these initiatives, and it's that they are just small-scale niches. Some of them are. This is often... Uh, sorry. <laughs> and I disagree here. I disagree that it's only small-scale niches. I do not think that what matters is uh, how to scale them up. In some cases, it might be, make sense, but in most cases, I don't think the scaling small niches up is the way to go. In fact, most of the time, such experiments work very well at the local level, at the small-scale level, and they lose their meaning 
and their transformative power if they're generalized. Rather, I think the social experiments can become places where people are empowered against all these Tina narratives. There is no alternative narratives. These are laboratories where social innovation is literally forged and where people participating in them can find the power and the motivation for resisting, building alliances, and continue the transformation in other areas of life. And then can prepare themselves for struggles. We need to know how it feels to live differently, otherwise we cannot figure it out. This is why I think that concrete utopias are spaces in which we can collectively relearn to desire. Learn collectively about what our desires and not the preferences of, uh, of economists are. In such laboratories for the future, we have the chance of provisionally suspending and starting to question pseudo-desires and the satisfaction of needs imposed by the existing structures. Here we can start a collective learning process about needs, desire, As uh, Ivan Illich, the great critique of development, writes, in contemporary industrial societies, humans are driven into a drug addiction-like state. This is why our desires are shaped. In which people lose their autonomy, which is for Illich the capacity to creatively deal with problems and find solutions adequate to the context. And people are then delivered to the systemic and technical forces of the development machine. This is one of my favorite quotes. I read it. Prisoners in rich countries often have access to more things and services than members of their families outside the prison. But they have no say in how things are to be made and cannot decide what to do with them. They are degraded to the status of mere consumers. Economic growth has secured for a large amount of people a fairly good life in material terms for a long time. Consumption has thus replaced political debates about the conditions for a good life by strengthening the illusion of freedom of options. But this is shrinking desire. And thus, consumption has numbed our capacity to desire better and desire more. Education of desire is a common project, is a common learning process, means also education to autonomy as a... Sorry, I read it again. Education of desire is a common learning process, <coughs> means also education to autonomy as a collective project. It means giving us collectively the limits that we have chosen instead of having the conditions for the common living imposed from by some kind of indisputable belief such as economic growth or, this, or, or a self-regulating global market. In order to start a serious debate about needs and desires, experience, test, and critically discuss alternatives. From there, we can then start reclaiming 
and regaining control over and transforming the framework conditions for a good life for all. Thank you very much.